Thank you guys very much. Uh, coming to you live from my wonderfully beautiful wood paneled 1960s basement. So uh, excuse the decor. I'll move on to the slides here. One second here. All right. Looks like sun is streaming through the window. So exactly. <laughs> I just grabbed my slideshow here. Well, thanks everybody. Let me uh, just get this into slideshow mode here. One second. Okay. All right. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. Okay, great. All right. So the topic that uh, I was expanding research on was uh, on uh, comic books as a media form and how they were used uh, as American propaganda during World War II. T today's world, superheroes are everywhere. They're woven into the very fabric of, of our pop culture, from Superman to Captain America, Batman to The Flash. These are characters that, whether we're viewers or not, many are still very much aware of uh, their fictional existence as creations in the uh, media of comic books. That source material uh, from newsprint pages provides some of the fodder for some of the largest financial successes in modern entertainment. From Black Panther, which was inspired by the Marvel comic book character the same name, was a film that gross $624 million by March of this year. And in fact, tonight, as I make this presentation, many movie moviegoers are lining up at cinemas to see Avengers Affinity War, the latest in Disney's expansion of a cinematic universe based on Marvel comic characters and estimated to bring in an astounding $500 million opening. So the Avengers, the Justice League, the Fantastic Four, the X-Men, in today's world, the idea of superheroes has not only become a mainstream accepted piece of our pop culture, but so has the idea of superhero teams, groups of individuals with unique superhuman abilities banded together for a common cause to defeat a common enemy and save the world and its people as we know it. With such bombastic financial successes, the idea of the superhero team has no longer been relegated to that of the comic book page. And such success in a mainstream medium like films and television uh, has also provided the concept of superhero groups with a wider audience, a wider acceptance of its base material uh, in comic books. But it wasn't always that way. It was once relegated to the four colored pages of newsprint periodicals on newsstands with heroic characters that had to leap from the pages one minute and then in many cases disappeared into obscurity the next as publishers and creators were throwing anything they could think of at the wall like proverbial spaghetti to see what would stick and make money. The characters that populated uh, comics and pulp magazines in the early 20th century of America were a reflection of a continuing fascination with hero figures by Americans. The frontiers were closing and the imagery of the cowboy had become a less relatable figure compared to everyday life in urban cities. New heroes were rising to fill those adventure fantasies, heroes that reflected more of the new industrialized urban world. It would come to be known as the golden age of comic books, beginning from the late 1930s and would last until about the mid-1950s, when most superheroes would find their popularity with audiences fading in a post-war world. And that golden age, however, would become synonymous uh, with the rise of the superhero genre, and the real-life villains of the 1940s would begin to populate its pages, a reflection of the changing world facing uh, those creators and their readers at the same time. And just who were reading these books, who was taking in this new form of media? To understand who was reading it helps understand why comic books would come to find themselves as a useful tool of American propaganda, one that flew under the radar in ways that radio and film just couldn't do. And that answer is a broader audience than many would think. Children certainly were reading comics. Uh, in fact, estimates post-war in about 1946 show that nine out of every 10 children behind the ages of eight to 15 read comic books. The bright colors, the quick dialogue, and the adventure made comics an immediate hit with children as a source of cheap entertainment. But they weren't alone, and that's where I think a lot of people get mistaken, especially with that time period. Comic books found themselves in the waiting hands of adult audiences, both civilian and members of the armed forces, helping publishers sell millions of copies of comic book titles on the newsstands in the early 1940s. In 1941, Superman comics sold roughly 10 million copies that year. Captain America sold a million copies a month. The popularity of comics was so broad and had so broad an audience uh, that it meant the publishers amid paper rationing had to begin slashing the number of pages in their books, the only way to keep up with the demand for their product. In fact, in 1941, a DC Comics press agent claimed that Superman had a reach of 35 million people across the country in its various media forms. Between appearances as a balloon in the 1940 Macy's Day Parade, a radio series that began in 1940, and appearing in animated shorts in movie theaters in 1941, he had crossed various media platforms and brought in many adult readers to an already popular comic book character. 
And it's also been argued that the mere presence of child sidekicks that proliferated among many comic books in the early 1940s were a way to actually draw in more young readers, which they didn't have enough of at the time, uh, as they already had a, a sizable, comfortable adult audience. The reach of comics only increased during America's involvement in World War II, with comics being sold on military bases, many civilians back home sending their used copies of comics to servicemen. They were regularly consumed by almost half of all soldiers and sailors, with the Navy at one point classifying them as essential supplies. With simple but effective uh, use of pictures and text to tell stories, it was a format that was comprehensible almost regardless of your education, your class, or your status. Before the Second World War, uh, before comics became a media form all their own, there was just the dawn of a pamphlet that would be known uh, as a comic book. In 1933, a man named Max Gaines found that folding a standard newsprint sheet about three times with a staple in the middle of the booklet could be a way to use and resell uh, weekly comic strips in a new format. After he got the rights to use such comic strips, uh, he contacted Eastman Color Printing, and they created the very first comic book called Famous Funnies, a carnival of comics. It was nothing more than reprints that had been repackaged and resold, but it proved to be so successful uh, on the newsstands, they soon needed to start finding additional new material in order to sell more. And many publishers rose to the challenge to do this. Leading the way was National Allied Publications with its breakout stars, Superman debuting in 1938 and Batman one year later in 1939. From these two templates exploded a cornucopia of superheroes uh, and publishers for every taste, including all American publications and their roster of characters like The Flash, Green Lantern, Hawkman, and many more. So the button keeps disappearing here. But why am I talking about comic books? What role do they play in information and visual design? The end product of a comic book is essentially visual design theories at work. And they're used to draw up support in World War II as a perfect example of the way that propaganda theories and principles were used to change a person's thinking. As Lidwell Butler and Holden point out in Universal Principles of Design, closure is the idea that people perceive sets of individual elements or pieces as one pattern instead of individual pieces. In comic books, scenes in time are presented and a reader's mind supplies what happens in between them. Every action, every movement is not necessary in order to communicate the information within a story. Likewise, Lidwell Butler and Holden describe entry point as the way that attention is drawn into a design. A perfect example of this is a comic book cover, which in order to grab the interest of a potential reader has to meet the parameters of minimal barriers with little obstacle to looking inside, a clear starting point, open the cover and the story begins, and progressive lures, a bright, splashy visual to lure in the eyes and grab the attention of the newsstand. Those bright splashes of color across the covers of comic books and the newsstands hope to grab the attention of all those potential customers and get them in there enough to take a peek inside. These eye-catching covers provided minimal barriers, progressive lures, and uh, into, to get inside to the breezy adventures within the pages. This clear entry point gave potential readers of varying ages all the intrigue and information they needed to, for lack of a better term, judge a book by its cover. And spend 10 cents, which at the time, uh, an average weekly income was about $38 for the settings that were both familiar, exotic, and clearly defined characters of good and evil that made up the storytelling inside. These two design principles, exposure, effect, and familiarity, are key in understanding why comics provided such an ample use for war propaganda and message delivery. Exposure effect states that the more we're exposed to something, the more accepting we are of it. Likewise, familiarity, often used in marketing campaigns, states that we tend to like things the more fre frequently we're exposed to it which is why many of the common themes, phrases, and viewpoints used within comic stories at the time were so often repeated. Some of the examples that I have here are the common recruiting phrase for the armed services, keep them flying, which you saw repeatedly in comics at the time. Of course, grabbing a reader with a cover is worthless without what lies underneath and inside the pages, which is where storytelling comes in. As noted in Universal Principles, storytelling is used to engage an audience and evoke emotion, and is done so through elements such as characters, plot, setting, events, and more. We'll find that during the time of World War II, the emotions that were being evoked were support for a war that many in the U.S. were not eager to get involved in before Pearl Harbor. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this slide, but I offer it merely as a visual to see and spread out some of the key elements of the comic industry intertwined with the real-world elements, events, pardon me, of World War II, starting with the premiere of Famous Funnies in 1933 and the premieres of now very noteworthy characters, as well as the first wartime uh, cover with Superman in 1941, 
uh, in Pearl Harbor in December of 1941 and the changing tone that we'll get to uh, in just a bit. As the war rages on in Europe, most comic book characters kept to the sidelines. With the exception of Captain America promoting support for other nations and veiled references of the war, but it's not until the bombing of Pearl Harbor that most comic books went all in on support of America's involvement. And we'll have more on that in just a moment. Nazi Germany would invade Poland in September 1939, but it would take two more years and an attack on Pearl Harbor by Japan to jolt America out of its isolation and join Great Britain and Russia against what became known as the Axis powers of Germany, Italy, and Japan. Prior to the war, the enemies of the battlefield were far from the minds of many, and the depictions of comic book antagonists reflected this the threat of crime often within America's own borders. Heroes like Superman stood up to corrupt politicians, greedy industrialists who put their workers at risk for the benefit of filling their own coffers, slumlords, robbers, and murderers. It was the stuff of urbanization nightmares in an increasingly centralized population. Anyone who mistreated or took advantage of the working class and poor of the early 20th century were prime targets for the fledgling superhero class, forcing upon them lessons of moral and social justice. One early Superman tale had a, the Man of Steel kidnap a manufacturer of munitions, carrying him to the front lines of a war that the manufacturer had instigated. In the early 20th century society of sprawling urbanism, the themes of a hero disguised under a persona of meekness, such as Clark Kent and Superman, resonated with many who were adjusting to modern life as a face in the city crowds and had felt that soft city life diminished the parts of their masculinity of rural generations on the frontier that had come before. These stories and heroes reflected the insulated nature of the American mindset of the time, far away from the dangers as Japan occupied China in the late 30s. The world was changing, and heroes from the cowboys of yesteryear to the dawning of the superhero age provided readers with fantasies and vehicles to cope with, understand, and accept the changes of the world that was around them. This came through the actions and moral standards of their fictional heroes, reworked into new narrative formulas and formats, but providing readers the outlet they needed for their fears and hopes of what was to come and what could possibly be. Following the, the events of World War I, many Americans felt it not the country's place to interfere in international affairs, and a sense of American isolation uh, took hold under the uh, administration of the anti-imperialist President Herbert Hoover. However, as the war continued to spread in Europe, comics began to reflect a concern for the threats that were looming over in other countries, if not yet the world, even if the war had not yet found its way to America's doorstep. In 1940, something very different happened with the publication of a comic book called All-Star Comics. With the third issue of All-Star Comics, it offered readers, uh, offering readers, pardon, readers got more bang for their buck, or more daring do for their dime. Cover price of a standard comic at the time was a dime. When writer Gardner Fox and a stable of artists inadvertently created what would become a comic book and eventually a pop culture norm, the superhero team. Calling themselves the Justice Society of America, the team was made up of all American publication characters like The Flash, Green Lantern, Hawkman, and others. With more than 70 pages of adventure for but a dime, which is the equivalent of roughly $2.47 in 2015, readers made All-Star Comics and the Justice Society of America a hit for roughly the next decade. And as readers continued to thrill to these adventures between the pages, the real world was beginning to see a rising tide of action itself. And although their formation came before the war, even the shift from individual heroes to a super team, such as the Justice Society, held within it a certain subtext that cooperation and working together on all fronts was necessary for success in a war. Numerous comic book stories began to turn the focus of their heroes away from the regular onslaught of robbers and murderers, corrupt businessmen, and social causes, and instead began to see an influx of spies, saboteurs, or war profiteers. While America wasn't involved in the war, and many still had opposition to such a move, heroes like Superman, Green Lantern, The Flash, and their cohorts were dealing with the followers and supporters of ideas marching through Europe. Themes of chaos, unrest, and savagery perpetrated the four-color world, but with the notion that these things could ultimately be overcome. Working to suppress any of the reservations that may have been had about putting American feet into the battlefield once again. And the notion of direct confrontation was rarely there. However, as fears of U.S. involvement in the war grew, the threat of urban crime and those greedy industrialists we talked of earlier that plagued society gave way to more and more stories that involved Nazis menacing other countries, bullying the weak, and doing whatever they could to subvert the ideals of American democracy. 
With the increase of villainy within comics pages being perpetrated by those who stood against the ways of American life, so too did comics see a rise in superheroes draped in over-the-top patriotism. At a time of national crisis, these characters looked to create support on the home front among readers, generating a sense of patriotism as they took on threats like those spies and saboteurs. Superheroes during wartime not only became figures of dominant cultural ideals, but were in fact pushing for a change in culture, looking for America to put aside its isolationism and actually take part in the war. And this messaging wasn't isolated to any one company. There were hundreds of comics vying for space on the newsstands, and among them was Captain America comics from a publisher called Timely, which would later go on to become the multimedia juggernaut known as Marvel. Created by a pair of uh, artists and writers with Jewish immigrant, immigrant roots, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, Captain America was tailor-made as a poster child for America's involvement in World War II. Kirby and Simon were two of the many comic book creators of Jewish backgrounds who were especially concerned and offended by Hitler's actions in Europe. With the atrocities in Europe a lively topic of conversation at home and among friends, many comic creators wanted America to intervene with the war and began including more information on the ongoing conflict or using the war as a backdrop to their stories. Interestingly enough, another form of media, the film industry, and the Jewish moguls who ran it were actually hesitant to push for American entry into the war. But for the creators of comic books who were immigrants or from immigrant families, being pro-war meant fighting for their assimilation, for tolerance, and for acceptance. These were the ideals they saw as American and saw as the right thing that their superhero creations were fighting for as well. Whether it was Wonder Woman rescuing prisoners from concentration camps or the Justice Society providing food to starving camp prisoners, the war had started to become more real for many Americans and in turn for its fictional heroes, continuing to distill the complexities of what was happening in the real world down to basic good versus evil dynamics that were easy for comic readers at any level of education to understand and motivate to desire change. I spoke with DC, longtime DC Comics editor and writer Bob Rosakis, also a noted comics historian, who worked with many of the founding members of the comic industry in their twilight years. He told me that he suspects that what was going on in Europe was a topic of conversation among most, if not all of the guys in the business, regardless of their religious background. And to keep in mind that almost all of them were only a generation or two removed from actually living in Europe. So there would be familial con concerns about what was going on in, quote, the old country. Rosakis also noted to me not to underestimate the need and desire by creators at the time to become inspired by real life situations for their characters, ripping the ideas for spies and saboteurs straight from news headlines and right onto their comics page. Dave, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I just want to make sure that you leave a little bit of time to peek at the web resource that you put. Absolutely, up. absolutely. I'll try and I apologize. I'm trying to speak a little faster, but hopefully not. Because <laughs> we'll have questions in about four or five minutes. All right, then I'll, I'll uh, you know, what, I'll jump around a little bit and I'll try to skip over a few things. Um, on December 7, 1941, all those ideas of isolationism and hope for the U.S. to stay outside of the battles of Europe were shattered uh, with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The U.S. went to war, and so too did American comic books. All around support on the front lines as well as on the home front were seen as essential to an allied victory in the war. In order to drum up support, government agencies looked to posters, radio, film, and various other forms of media in order to shape the perceptions in favor of U.S. involvement in the war. And it's important not to underestimate the social impact of propaganda absorbed by youth. After all, these children grew up to become voters, soldiers, and officials in society. And it wasn't just America agencies that understood this. Germany certainly did as well. By today's standards, the idea of using comic books as a form of propaganda might seem a bit outlandish or even corny. And today, with both our common understanding of propaganda and media and the vastness of the media landscape itself, the effort would likely come off as transparent, as noted by longtime DC and Marvel writer-editor Tom Pyre told me in a discussion. But in a time of limited media consumption, it was a real thing. And to put it to use was a group called the War Writers Board, which was a government agency uh, which, among various forms of the media, had its eye on this popular and young industry of comic books to help shape its message of the war and its enemies. Comics, unlike any other media at the time, had no censorship, which meant they had no reason to blur flat-out opinions under allegory. Propagandists with the WWB could work with comic writers and artists to freely and overtly portray the country's enemies as inhuman monsters, seeking nothing more than chaos and the pursuit of evil. Comic books flew under the radar, so they were a perfect tool for the WWB to use to reach both civilians and servicemen wary of blatant government-produced propaganda. They began in 1943 to contact comic book publishers, asking for cooperation from their staffs in creating stories 
uh, on proposals by the WWB, as well as to seek input from them for suggestions from the board and stories when it came to race or wartime topics. And their goals were multifold. Unity for the war, vigilance against enemy spies, fighting back against Axis propaganda, portrayal of the enemy as inhuman and evil, and assurance that America and their allies were on the side of right. Following that attack on Pearl Harbor, the uh, limited use of uh, the Axis and comics shifted into high gear, and they played upon the desire of many Americans for revenge and railing people to support the fight through any means they could, be it on the front line or back at home. And many stories focused on these Axis powers wanting to rule the world with a particular focus on the threat of Germany and Japanese forces. Um, and in 1944, as losses began to pile up uh, and an end wasn't exactly in sight, the WWB worried that uh, there wasn't enough uh, evil portrayal of the Axis in comics and pushed to have creators weave particular animosity based on ethnicity or race in an effort to increase support for the U.S. policy of complete war. And under this plan by the WWB, Germany and Japan were increasingly depicted by racial stereotypes and were irredeemable, lacking any humanity. And many of the American writers at the time lacked the cultural knowledge and just relied on those stereotypes uh, in their writing. While they did that, they also portrayed most uh, Americans as uh, chiseled, handsome men with vast knowledge of science technology, uh, always doing what's right, while American women always portrayed as the veritable pinup girl. Um, in the context of one notable uh, War Writers Board influence story called This Is Your Enemy, uh, the heroes of the Justice Society traveled through time to convince a young American who was skeptical of the war that Germans had always been a war-hungry people and that this is why he should see the error of his ways and be in favor of all-out war with Germany. At, oops, uh, at the same time that the WWB was helping to generate comic book stories that vilified the wartime enemies, they were also trying to create stories that promoted uh, international cooperation and racial harmony. Um, it wasn't true equality they were promoting, but racial tolerance, which is, I think is an important distinction to make, um, but they saw it as crucial to victory. Um, however, it came, comes off now historically as very uh, contradictory when put uh, up against the very same messages of vilification for the enemies um, to have messages of unity regardless of race, religion, or creed within some of those um, same pages. And when the WWB was gone to by publishers to try and find ways to be more sensitive to other cultures, they either by lack of care um, or by legitimate lack of knowledge had no answers uh, to provide the publishers. Um, and before I move on to the next slide, I want to mention that um, it wasn't, it's not necessarily even uh, cultural uh, ethnicities um, that saw vilification or, or contradictions uh, in the pages of this propaganda at the time. Now, Wonder Woman certainly had her own uh, share of gender role contradictions. Um, she saw her empowering persona at odds with social limitations put onto her by the male creators at, at the time. And for all her, you can see that within the stories itself, for all her might and breaking of the, uh, we'll call it paper ceiling in comic books, um, she kind of was she falls in love with the first man she ever sees. And when she uh, joins this, the first superhero team in comics, even though she seems to have all the might of Superman uh, is relegated to being the uh, justice society's secretary for their entire tenure. Um, legacy fear of losing the war made the stakes very high for the, the heroes and the reader and fear mongering was a standard uh, within these stories, hoping to sway those who were opposed to the to U S involvement through the image that their country, their homes, their lives were in immediate danger. If action was not to be taken by the U S and the more patriotic tones and comics became a win for all those who were involved in the production by allowing their books and characters to promote the government agendas. The publisher sold more copies, made more money, reached more readers than ever before and gave a legitimacy to their industry through a veneer of patriotism. Skip over uh, uh, a few things here because I, I, uh, I want to speed it up. Um, it, while many of these characters have lasted well beyond their creators, taking on lives well beyond the print pages of the 30s and 40s and creating billion dollar industries, when you look back at the histories, aspects of their time, especially during World War II era, can be problematic when not looked at through a lens of historical and cultural context. And while not a crux of my research here, I think especially with Dr. Lazardi's presence, it's important to note the role of nostalgia at play with these types of media texts, especially in a world where everything is reprinted, collected, digitized, and becoming more accessible. As more and more witnesses and participants to World War II pass away, their experiences pass along with them. 
And for new generations who come across these particular media texts, perhaps down a path charted by interest in a particular fictional character, it's important, I feel, to note the potential for a skewed, idealized, and in many cases whitewashed view of this era without the knowledge to know that while, yes, they're, what they're reading is fictional, it was also heavily influenced by propaganda interests at the time. Before I wrap up, I want to quickly point out the digital product aspect of this research, which was my intention to create a quasi-virtual museum or space to house and display um, many of the types of images from the media texts that I'm discussing. Um, divided into basic categories uh, covering comic book covers, uh, the home front before U.S. involvement, uh, comics during the U.S. involvement of war, and the depictions and contradictions of enemy vilification and cultural unification, and uh, flat out public service announcements, I had hoped to create an easily accessible and viewable set of galleries of media texts from the time, uh, and notes from my own research acting at the, at the top of each entry, uh, gallery entry, uh, in the same way that a placard would introduce a concept or exhibit of art uh, with an actual physical museum. I, have a uh, I do that with a slider uh, intro here, um, the colors of the bursts that you see here chosen with the color wheel uh, that we had uh, used uh, in earlier classes to make sure that any colors I used were of uh, were across from each other on the color wheel, much like the early designs of superhero costumes in order to stand out the most. Um, each gallery is put, as I say, it has a note at the beginning uh, regarding their use and then once it loads here, um, provides either a click-through view um, or at the side on my viewer of our windows is in the way here, uh, but um, in order to see these public service announcements that worked for everything from paper drives to um, um, sorry, my internet's a little slow. Um, everything from, from paper drives or if you see something, say something messages. Um, two categories uh, about shifting from isolation to the actual war itself. And each of these pieces that I've put in here is in uh, uh, chronological order, so that if you were to view them through here, you can start to see the change in the texts uh, of storytelling um, as you move along. I know I've really talked a lot longer than I probably should have. Any of you who know me know that that is a very bad habit of mine. And with that, I'm going to shut up and I'm going to uh, let you guys <laughs> grill me as much as you'd like. Um, I, is anyone else dying to start? I can start if no one has anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think this was really a wonderful project. And you know that. That's what Thank I you. told you. Um, I, I, I guess I would tell the group here that the project was really the paper and the um, digital artifact here is kind of an add-on at the end to fill it out and make it um, make everybody happy. Uh, but if you read the paper, you'd see that um, it's just a really fascinating tale and it's told really beautifully and um, we are the, this is definitely the one thesis that has the word daring do in it. And I, I just learned so much from um, the connection, the way that you painted the picture of social justice in comic books that I really hadn't given any thought to. Um, so one thing I was wondering is you didn't really say anything about what this is. Like you jump right in and you don't say about like the thesis, I'm Dave, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then in your paper, there wasn't a whole lot of reflection of sort of, you know, I've done this, I, you know, this is what it entailed. Um, and it doesn't really say it makes sense to have a method section because it's not really that kind of a study. Um, but I would suggest a, a little bit of that for us. Okay, like, like a, uh, an add-on to the paper, you think, describing the, the, the process of creating the digital product? Yes. Okay. And yeah, something and something a little bit personal from you, so the reader has some sense of um, why you care about this. And okay. Like, well, what about an introduction? Would that putting it at the beginning? Would that would that almost like an like an introduction or, or a prologue? Would would that be a good way? Yeah. To go? okay. Either way, we can talk about that later on. Okay. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, Dave, I thought this was really cool because. Um, you know, we get such a wide variety of projects coming through IDT. And so this is 
one of the more academic geek projects, which I think is great. And we, um, and we You're probably the only person in the world who's ever referred to anything I've done as academic y, so I appreciate that very much. So thank very you. So. And, you know, there's, and, and, and not to suggest that we just get a really wide variety of work. And yours would, I would, I, to me, you did a thesis, not a project. And you chose to represent the findings of your thesis digitally, but it doesn't make it a project. So, and I think that's great, but then you're also kind of skirting the two and that's perfect. So, it's, it's, um, you know, that, but it's the content is great. And the story, I love the way that you tell the story. And it's, oh, nice, you. you know, it's nice to have that kind of, um, yeah. Anyway, so <clears throat> the only thing I would suggest if you're going to present this is show more comics in your presentation. Okay. You know, if you ever present this again, just because what's cool is the comics. I mean, not that what yeah, you're it's cool. the visual of those. Yeah. You know, so just in, you know, and sort of follow Russ's advice instead of putting words on slides, put comics on slides and say the words. Okay. Okay. You know, just, just as a general, if you, if you, you know, because then you should, if you, if you wanted to, you could ter certainly take this to academic conferences. Or, um, and probably Ryan and Eve are going to be a lot better at, at knowing where this stuff would go. But, um, you okay. know, Ryan, this goes to like PCA, right? Yep, that's exactly. I was going to say PCA, CSA, yeah. um, a lot of good stuff like that. Yeah. Well, then I may have to. I may have to start pestering you to find out more about that. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, you know, def take this to PCA, and you know, we'll get Popular Culture Association, and present a paper at an academic conference, and it's cool. It's fun. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to throw in that uh, it's always amazing seeing, you know, this was when I was a kid, really picking up comic books for a dime and reading them. And um, it strikes me how it there's so much color in it, you know, because this is at a time people forget it was a black and white world, you know, TV was black and white, photos were black and white. You, your photos that you showed were black and white too. And books, of course, newspapers were totally black and white. And so suddenly we had these really contrasting RGB colors, you know, that were really changing uh, and, and pretty exciting for us. I mean, this was the closest we had to animation when I was 10 years old anyway. <laughs> so, so thanks. Um, yeah, I was gonna, thank oh, you. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Ryan. I was gonna say, um, so you're, you're, one of the things I think is, um, it may be an interesting ad on or sort of like a footnote is you're making such an interesting argument about the role of media in terms of its ability to to sort of be an, an arbiter of morals or 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 at least sort of take a stand when maybe others wouldn't and i think it's interesting to counterpose that to sort of the re, the sort of reactionary view about media that often often ends up is still today, you know, you hear the violence in video games argument. And so I'm, I'm interested in thinking of, uh, or maybe if you just, like I said, maybe just a tiny footnote of that when in 1954, the, the seduction of the innocent was written essentially are coming like a couple years after this, you know, you you laid out such a great argument about the, um, you know, the wide readership. It wasn't just for kids. It was you know, taking on serious content. And yet then you have one book that, essentially sets the tone for comics research for the next 30 years or maybe at least 20 years that said, Oh, it's, you know, it's corrupting our youth. And same thing happens with films. You have cappers why we fight, but yet you get the pain fund studies that say, Oh, it's just a, corrupting our youth. And so I think you're sort of presenting a counter argument. That's really important. Um, and so maybe just a footnote about how sometimes that counter argument ha or, or historically that counter argument hasn't really been the norm or at least okay. hasn't been accepted as, you know, comics were seen as, you know, crushing our youth's brains and <laughs> same as video games and films and all that kind of stuff. Great. I, thank you. Yes, that's, yeah. that's great. I probably could, I, I admit, I probably could have like tinkered with this for, for another like five semesters uh, to be honest, but I absolutely. It's a fascinating topic. Had yeah. to rein myself in. <laughs> Well, congratulations, Dave. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And <laughs> Thank you all very much for your help, for your, your suggestions along the way. Uh, Welcome. Really and let's get together sometime, and I can give you some of the little piddly things, but there really aren't very many at all. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks. Um, I mean, daring do. <laughs> always fun to, Let me um, stop taking the screen hostage here. Okay. <laughs>